Hello everyone, Hyper here, and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats video for Mythic Carapace. I am once again joined by Lozi and Shampi to help out with the tanking and healing sections. Please keep in mind that we also have a written guide available over on Wowhead, so if you need some reference material and some diagrams that you can look at, you can check out the link in the description box. Without further ado, let's get started. First, let's look at the Mythic changes. Carapace has quite a few changes, with some of the big ones being that Adaptive Membrane now is applied to players as well as enemy targets, and this will become an important mechanic in Phase 2 and Phase 3, because whenever a player breaks their Adaptive Membrane by taking damage, they will generate a Shard of Sanity. Now, this Shard of Sanity will restore 10 Sanity to all players within a certain radius whenever someone comes in contact with it. And in Phase 2 and Phase 3, this is the only way of recharging your Sanity Bar. Another big change in Phase 1 is that Gaze of Madness and Horrific Hemorrhages, which are the little adds that spawn and the big tentacles that slam down, will spawn at the exact same time. So you will get a set of adds spawn about 40 seconds into the fight, um, so that's going to be two tentacles slamming down, kind of parallel to each other, and two gazes of madness spawning. Then at about 1 minute and 40 seconds into the fight, this will repeat itself and you will have two tentacles slam down in kind of a V shape. And once again, you will have two gazes of madness spawn that your raid needs to damage down. As soon as the boss gets pushed to 50.5%, he will phase to phase 2. Phase 2 is very similar to Heroic, you just need to split your raid up into two different groups. You go on the left and the right side, DPSing down all the synthesis growths. However, the big change is that once all the synthesis growths are killed, the boss will instantly phase and move on to the Phase 3 room, rather than waiting and having to DPS him down to 40% like you do on Heroic. In Phase 3, the major change is that there will be lines of mycelial cysts throughout the room that will kind of block your raid's path whenever you need to move for those infinite darkness casts. We'll talk about this more in the strategy section. Moving on to the strategy section. In phase 1, there will be a group of players who will be assigned to dealing with what we call the far gaze. The Gaze of Madness that spawns around the middle line of the room rather than next to the exit will need a few players, we typically have 3 DPS players, 1 tank and 1 healer assigned to go and kill it. This will spawn right after you see the tentacle animation for them slamming down, so those players need to make it to the middle of the room between the two tentacles before that slam actually happens. In general, whenever players interrupt the Breed Madness cast, they need to do it right before Adaptive Membrane is applied to them, because once Adaptive Membrane is applied, it is no longer possible to interrupt them. And this means if you kick them right before Adaptive Membrane is applied, they will also be on a lockout while your raid has a chance to actually break the shield and finish off the Gaze of Madness. While the 5 players are dealing with the Far Gaze, everyone else in the raid will be dealing with the one by the exit of the room, and as soon as it dies, the boss can be dragged between the two tentacles in the middle, and all the horrific hemorrhages can be finished off. After all the adds are cleaned up, we typically stop DPS whenever the boss is at 70% until the second wave of adds spawn, which is a minute and 40 seconds into the fight. The reason we do this is so the boss doesn't push too fast after we finish off the second wave, because if that happens, then 2 minute cooldowns and 3 minute cooldowns might get messed up for the intermission phase or phase 2. On the second set of adds, the tentacles will slam down in a V shape, blocking off access to the Rathion area. The only way to get back from the main part of the room to the Rathion area is to use your cloak. Now, the 5 players who are assigned to killing the far gaze can move to that area before the tentacles slam down or can move there right after they do by using their cloak. Everyone else in the raid needs to kill off the horrific hemorrhages that are on the inside of the tentacles, finish off the gaze of madness that spawns by the exit, then use their cloak back to the Rathion area and finish off all the other horrific hemorrhages. After this happens, the boss should be very close to phasing. The only thing you need to keep in consideration are madness bombs. 
You don't want to push the boss right as a new wave of madness bombs go out because they will time out as everyone's trying to get through the tunnel and people will get feared and they will be late getting to their assigned sites. In phase two, the main strategy is to split your raid in half with very strong cleave classes going on the right ramp and the strong single target classes going on the left ramp. This is because on the right side in the back of the ramp, there are two clusters of three synthesis growths meaning that cleave classes will gain a lot more value. While on the left side, most of the synthesis growths are by themselves or at most they're stacked next to another one. So there's only two by each other. Since the right side has synthesis growths that are clumped together, you also need to deal with more of them. On the right side, there are nine total synthesis growths, while on the left side, there are only seven. Let's go over the left side strategy very quick. The only thing that matters here is kind of hitting some timings that might interfere with how fast you're able to deal with your side. You need to kill the first two synthesis growths before the boss gets its first adaptive membrane cast off. As soon as that happens, your entire left side should be working on the third synthesis growth. Right after breaking his shield, it should be pretty much dead, so your team can move on to the fourth and fifth ones. Right after this, the boss will cast two adaptive membranes pretty close back to back, making it important to only have two synthesis growths remaining when the third cast happens, after which you can finish them off and jump down to get ready to move into phase three. Quickly going over the right side strategy, your raid should kill the first two synthesis growths before the boss casts its first adaptive membrane cast. While this is happening, two to three players, ideally fire mages, uh, frost death knights, or any class that has very strong cleave burst, should be moving to the back of the ramp because at the top of the ramp on the right side there are three synthesis growths right next to each other and the players the two to three players assigned to kill these should save their cooldowns for this part of the encounter because each player needs to target a specific synthesis growth because they need to break its adaptive membrane by themselves and that's why cleave classes are so good because they're efficiently doing damage to two to three targets as soon as two of the adaptive membranes are broken, all the players who are assigned to the back of the room can start focusing down the third synthesis growth. Usually whenever the third one dies, the rest of the group who's been dealing with synthesis growths along the wall catch up. Once the whole group is at that oval part of the ramp, you need to wait a few seconds for mycelial cysts to begin casting their regenerative expulsion. You will see it indicated on the ground by a red circle. As soon as those start, your entire group should move past them and start dealing with the last three synthesis growths on the opposite wall. As soon as those are dead, your entire raid can jump down and proceed to phase three. Phase three can seem fairly complicated. However, it's a straightforward scripted movement that you need to do. The hardest part about this phase is dealing with insanity bombs correctly. As Whenever you push the boss in phase three, he will briefly pause at the top of the ramp. Use this time to get close to the mycelial cysts and have your warlock drop a dark gateway that goes across them. So your raid doesn't need to deal with DPSing them down to open up space for you to move across. You will simply click the warlock gate, which will take you across. It's very important that you wait until the boss starts casting eternal darkness to click the warlock gate because the AOE ability is baited on players. So if you have a few players take the gate too early, then there is a chance that the whole AOE effect will get baited on top of them. Right after you take the Warlock Gate, Adaptive Membrane will be cast to the boss and three players. These players need to stand in the purple puddle on the ground, and you can also use the red AOE from the Mycelial Cysts to take damage in order to break their membrane. It's important that players who have the membrane face towards the raid because the orbs, the shards of insanity that spawn whenever your membrane is broken will shoot out in the direction you're facing. Right after the three players adaptive membranes are broken, they should move back to the raid and everyone should move around as a unit picking up all the shards of sanity that have been generated. There should be four total, one from the boss and three from players. Right after this, you will get a set of insanity bombs and some slappers. 
The insanity bombs will go off after the slappers, however, players need to start moving in position and spreading out correctly before those slappers actually hit. Really mobile classes such as demon hunters and mages can actually go to the far side of the next mycelial cyst that you will need to damage down, while tanks can use the cyst that your raid traveled over for the first movement. After the insanity bombs go off, everyone should collapse back onto the boss and prepare for the second Eternal Darkness cast. Prior to this happening, your ranged DPS need to DPS down at least two mycelial cysts to open up a pathway for everyone to be able to run. If you have shamans or druids, this is a great place to use Windrush Totem or Stampeding Rower. As soon as that Eternal Darkness cast happens, your entire raid needs to move past the second set of cysts. From here on, this phase will essentially just repeat itself. You will get an Eternal Darkness cast, after which you, your raid will get a few adaptive membranes, after which you get Insanity Bombs and Slappers. So you need to make sure that you're dealing with all those correctly. For the second and third movement, your raid will need to actually run because your Warlock Gate will be on cooldown. So again, if you have Windrush Totem or Stampeding Rower on the third one, they're very beneficial. If not, your entire raid should be using Lightfoot Potions or their own mobility cooldowns to get out of that spot as fast as possible. By the time you make your way around to the fourth Eternal Darkness cast, your Warlock Gate cooldown will be back up. So for the fourth one, you will be able to take the Warlock Gate. And then for the fifth one, again, you will need to run. With today's damage numbers, it's very doubtful that your raid will actually get a fifth Eternal Darkness cast, however it is possible. In general, we choose to Bloodlust right after the second Eternal Darkness cast. Once everyone makes it past the Mycelial Cis, there's quite a bit of time to damage and also this spot lines up pretty well with 2 minute and 3 minute cooldowns. So keep in mind, after the second Eternal Darkness cast is typically when you should Bloodlust, however, if your fight goes on for quite a while, it is also possible to Bloodlust after the fourth movement because at this point, again, the boss will have quite a bit of downtime allowing you to actually get some damage in. The biggest tip I can give for phase three is make sure your entire raid is using a macro to take the Warlock Gate rather than trying to manually click it. When your entire raid is trying to click a Warlock Gate, people stand on top of it and people might have a hard time clicking it. So instead what you can do is actually set your Warlock Gate to your focus by using a macro and then use a specific keybind to interact with your focus frame. You can do this by following the instructions on your screen and that should make it 100% guaranteed that you take the Warlock Gate at the right time instead of staying behind because you're not able to click it. In phase 1, it might be tempting to use all your cooldowns on pull because this phase will last about 3 minutes. Classes with 2 minute cooldowns should delay their cooldown usage until the first wave of adds spawns. This will ensure that you get very efficient damage and they will also be back up for the ramp in phase 2. In this encounter, whenever you're killing any target, keep in mind if they have adaptive membrane or not. For example, if you're in the main group dealing with the close Gaze of Madness, the first Gaze of Madness and the second set of Horrific Hemorrhages will both get shielded and it's important to break that shield before it expires otherwise all the damage you did to it would go to waste. I recommend either having your nameplate set up or some weak aura to help you out tracking the amount of shield that's left on your targets. Phase 2 in particular has very strict adaptive membrane damage checks and if you miss those you might delay your phase 2 push time enough that one of the sides will end up losing a ton of sanity. The phase 3 damage check is not all that strict. The only recommendation I have is that mobile classes take the furthest spots from the boss while insanity bombs are out, while least mobile classes and tanks should stay closest to the boss so they don't have that much distance to run after those bombs actually expire. Also keep in mind that in phase 2 and phase 3, you should not randomly dot mycelial cysts, which are the little growths on the ground. This is because on Mythic, they behave differently than on Heroic. On Mythic, they will actually go immune for a while if you don't DPS them all the way, and then they will do an AoE explosion around themselves whenever they heal back to full. 
So you need to make sure you're only DPSing them if you're actually trying to clear a path. And even in that case, you need to make sure they get damaged all the way down rather than just randomly dotting them up. This is super important in phase three because if your raid has a bad timing with mycelial cysts and your ranged DPS aren't able to clear them because they went in immune since someone randomly dotted them up, your entire raid will have to run over them getting slowed while trying to get away from the Eternal Darkness cast. And that combination can be lethal. So you need to make sure you only damage the cysts if it's absolutely necessary. Let's go over cooldown usage real quick. Classes with minute and a half or shorter cooldowns can use their cooldowns on pull, and it will be back up for the second set of adds in phase one. Then the third use should be on the ramp in phase two. After that, just simply use it on cooldown during the last phase. Classes with 2 minute cooldowns should use their cooldowns in the first phase during the first set of adds. So fire mages, for example, are great for this. Then the second use of 2 minute cooldowns should be in the ramp phase during phase 2. Your third use of 2 minute cooldowns should line up perfectly with bloodlust after that second eternal darkness cast. And after that, just use it as soon as it's up. Classes with 3 minute cooldowns can use their cooldown on pull and it should be exactly back up when you start phase 2 and it can be used again. If your raid is pushing too fast then you can choose to run a longer cooldown for example if you're a demon hunter and only get a use of your meta in phase 1 and phase 3. However if your raid is still progging this boss it is likely that you'll be able to get a 3 minute meta in phase 1 right at the beginning in phase 2 during the ramp and in phase 3 shortly after Bloodlust. And now we'll talk about healers. So first we'll talk about healer comp. So for this fight you're going to want to bring 4 healers, and this isn't so much because there's a large amount of damage taken, but more so to be redundant during periods where your group is going to be split up, and you'll want 2 healers watching 10 people rather than 1 healer watching 10 people. So in terms of classes, Restoration Shaman is exceptionally good on this fight, mainly due to its utility. Link, Tremor Totem, Windrush Totem, and even APT are exceptionally valuable at different times on this fight. And other than Shamans, obviously Holy Pallies and Disc Priests are very good for damage, damage reduction, etc. So, as I said before, there isn't a lot of damage taken on Carapace, but it is important to understand the damage that your raid will take. And the reason for this is that the fight is quite bursty, which means that your highest chance of losing people will come from multiple dangerous mechanics overlapping and comboing players from full health. So one of those important mechanics to understand is adaptive membrane. Periodically, Carapace will apply a damage shield to three players, and if that damage is fully depleted, it will cause that player to take damage equal to the amount of damage absorbed. So this is important for healers to understand and be aware of because at certain parts of the fight, depleting that shield is a near certainty which means that those players are guaranteed going to be taking a chunk of extra damage while other raid damage is going on. So in terms of raid cooldowns, only phase one operates on a static timer, and the rest of the fight depends on your push timings. So unfortunately, this means that I can't give exact timings for cooldowns, but we can give general advice, and you can adjust based on when your guild pushes. So for phase one, you'll want to assign healing cooldowns and damage reduction cooldowns based on breed madness casts, and that's kind of it. There will be two in phase one before you push, ideally. And then in phase three, you'll want to assign cooldowns around infinite darkness casts as well as madness bomb explosion. Because you don't have a gateway for infinite darkness casts two and three, those will deal significantly more damage than infinite darkness one and four because you'll be standing on the ground and taking more ticks from that. So as healers, you should aim to have larger throughput cooldowns during infinite darkness two and three and just be aware that you may need to spot heal the lower people who. Uh, maybe slower and taking more damage. Uh, cooldowns that affect players in an area like Darkness, Link, and Barrier are better used on Infinite Darkness, and AoE cooldowns like Shout and Devo are better used on Madness Bombs, although you can choose to use them on Infinite Darkness as well if you're struggling with that. Uh, this notably leaves out Phase 2 for cooldowns, which, depending on your push timings, you probably will not have cooldowns back up from Phase 1. And even if you use them, they probably would not be back up in time for phase three. So unfortunately, this means that only short cooldowns like Avenge, Wings, or a Tide with Vision of Perfection will be usable in phase two. 
Uh, additionally, this means that phase two has a higher chance of danger than the other phases due to your lack of cooldowns and also the nature of that phase having precarious positioning. Obviously, your push timings may allow you to ignore this section about phase two, but your just depends on your guild and push timings. And now we'll talk about healer specific tips. So shamans should obviously talent into Windrush Totem and possibly APT if you're having trouble with your final set of Madness Bombs in Phase 3. If you do have two Windrushes, or one Windrush and a Stampeding Roar, you can use one on the ramp going into Phase 3, one on Infinite Darkness Cast 2, and then your Windrush from that ramp will be back up for Cast number 3. Additionally, you should be a generous Shaman and tremor for your friends who do get a Madness Bomb. Paladins are just all around broken for every boss this year, but one specific piece of advice for this boss is to uh, be a good guy and give your friends freedom during the run to the growths in phase two so that they can start DPSing early. Additionally, don't ever immunity a madness bomb. This fight requires two tanks, but doesn't require any specific tanking composition. That being said, a large part of this fight will revolve around the debuff you'll get from tanking ads called Nightmare Antibody. This will be relevant in all three phases, and you need to realize what tools you have available to deal with it in a pinch, since a lot of boss abilities will force you to move. Every tank has a way to deal with this, uh, such as planning out leaps, uses of Freedom's Tiger's Lust, or Wraithwalk. Just make sure to use these abilities when you need to. <clears throat> in general, almost every taunt swap should be done at two stacks of the Black Scar debuff in Mythic. Any second stack is a decent place to use a personal or external. It's not deadly by itself, so if you know no other damage is coming with it, you can just use standard active mitigation. In phase one, there will be an assignment for one tank to help kill the far gaze. This tank should start the fight by tanking the boss where he stands. After two stacks of the tank debuff, the first group split will occur. If you are the far gaze tank, your job is to help kill that gaze of madness and try to keep all of the nightmare antigens off your raid group. The other tank will be with the majority of the raid and is responsible for positioning the boss so that he is next to the high priority adds to kill. In this case, start by tanking the boss next to the hemorrhages on one side, moving to the close gaze if it's still alive, then to the hemorrhages in the middle of the map. You can actually run the boss into the shadow before the tentacle slam down, and if done correctly, this can net even more cleave as he will still be targetable and have two extra hemorrhages in his hitbox. The second group split functions much like the first one, except that the far gaze tank will not be able to taunt after two stacks since there will likely be tentacles in the way. The other tank will need to use their extra action button to get back to Rathion, and the far gaze tank can taunt the boss while he's running across the room. If the boss himself gets too close to Rathion's character, Rathion will be stunned. This should be avoided, so make sure to communicate when the first tank is cloaking so that the far gaze tank can be ready and in position. Boss positioning for the second split isn't much different either, just tank the boss near any available hemorrhages so that Cleave can hit both the boss and them. In phase two, tanks should be sent to opposite sides. Your only job, other than damage, is to pick up the nightmare antigens that spawn from each growth as it explodes. This may lead to a situation where you're at a high number of stacks while trying to run into phase three, so don't hesitate to save any of your snare clearing abilities or call for a grip here. In phase three, tanks go back to taunting at two stacks, except the first swap, which should be done after one stack, and then the rest at two. This isn't required, but it makes things line up a little more intuitively as the fight goes on. The boss should always be positioned close to the old infinite darkness puddle, as this will allow whichever players get targeted by adaptive membrane to still be in melee range of the boss while trying to break it. Due to this positioning, insanity bombs can get a little cramped in melee. As a tank, you can afford to take some hits of infinite darkness, so don't be afraid to use that section of the room for yourself, especially during the first set of bombs. The only movement that the boss does separate from the raid will be on the third time. The boss should be pulled ahead to the next quadrant as the bombs are going off, rather than being the stack point as it is for all other eternal darknesses. This is due to the fact that immediately after this, the boss has a chance to chain cast a few abilities, leaving it out of range. This will require your range DPS to switch to Sys significantly earlier than in all other moves. It's worth noting, especially for that move, that the boss gains a 100% damage buff whenever he is standing on the red ground, which is why it's important to have DPS to switch to them earlier in this case. While a mandible slam with the debuff is livable, if the boss ever has the damage buff while bombs are exploding or an infinite darkness cast ends, your raid will almost certainly wipe. Luckily, there's not too many times during the fight where this is an issue, but it's something to be aware of nonetheless.
Thank you so much for watching this video, and if you found it helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe for more. Thanks to Lozi and Shampi for helping me out. See you guys on the next one. Bye-bye.